Indians rush to buy property in LA. That's the headline that a lot of articles have been talking about recently. And houses are available for about $82,000, which is just 35 lakhs should you rush to buy in property in LA. This is Deepak Shanoi from Market Vision bringing you this show with Manish Jain, who works at M-Profit, has lived in LA and is more knowledgeable about LA housing prices and concepts than any of the writers who wrote this article, these articles, including me. Uh, welcome to the show, Manish. And should hey, thanks again, Deepak, for having me on uh, Market Vision. Thanks, Manish. And so let's jump right in. What? Uh, should Indians be doing? Should we be buying the next plane, going and buying a property for 35 lakhs in LA? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, uh, you know, you said that I probably know more than the, the writers. may not be completely true, but what I can tell you is, you know, spending, I think the, the article quoted $82,000 for a property in LA. Um, you know, having lived in LA for about seven or eight years, I can tell you $82,000 is not going to get you much. Uh, what ends up happening is those properties are very, very far away from the areas that most people want to live. So the kind of property you get, uh, you know, it, it's okay, but it's not what you hear about when you go to LA. You know, when people talk about, you know, condos by the beach or, you know, near Beverly Hills, these properties are nowhere near Beverly Hills. It's almost like, you know, saying, hey, I'm gonna spend, you know, 40, 50 likes and get a flat in Bombay. And when people say South Bombay, for 40, 50 likes, you might get a garage for your car, maximum. So I think the same thing can be said for 82000 in L.A. So it's not completely true. I mean, it is true. You can get some property for $82,000. Um, but, you know, there's a, there's a lot of pitfalls with getting a property like that uh, if you're sitting here in India and trying to manage the property in the U.S. Oh, uh, but, uh, you know, assuming 82000 is probably not the right thing, probably just, you know, uh, some deal that got done for a garage or something like that. Uh, probably the right ticket price is 150, 200,000. You know, somebody just told me Singapore, uh, there are apartments that go for, you know, uh, uh, effectively what is about 95 lakhs in India, which to a person trying to buy a property in Gurgaon, uh sounds like an attractive deal. Because here right. You, you pay 95 lakhs for nothing. Um, what should an Indian do that, or a person from India do who is looking to buy a property in the U.S., finds the prices attractive. Uh, the price is obviously not the only criteria. There's probably a lot more to it than, than, than is uh, being told to us. So what else would they be looking for? Right. I mean, that, and I think that's, that's the issue that a lot of people get lured is like, wow, you know, it's, let's just say, let's make it an easy $100,000. Let's say the property is $100,000. There's a lot of things that you may have to, you know, think about. You know, let's say the house is in a, let's say, uh, a community of other houses. So you have to pay, you know, a subdivision fee. So you've got to pay community fees. You've got, uh, you know, monthly uh, monthly uh, uh, fees going towards that. You've got property tax. So in the U.S., property tax is fairly high, especially in California. Uh, maybe not as high as some other states, but it definitely, you know, can be a significant portion. But that's something most people don't think about, you know, if you're staying here in India. So there are property taxes uh, now. So obviously, you know, you've bought the property, let's say $100,000, and now you want to rent it out. So, you know, the rules, just like in India, are they're very much in favor of the rentor. So you have to really watch out. If there's something wrong, you know, you better make sure you fix the problem right away. Um, and things are not cheap. You know, let's say the house has got central air conditioning. That could easily be, you know, one to two lakh expense just for air conditioning if something were to go wrong. Now, that's, of course, you know, you're sitting here in India and you're trying to manage your property in the U.S. A little bit more difficult. So you'll have to pay some company more than likely. Now, of course, those companies don't do it for charity. They're also going to charge a fee. You know, it could be anywhere from maybe two, three percent, maybe I don't know, maybe as high as ten percent. I'm not really sure. But there's a lot of issues that you have to really think about just beyond the actual purchase price itself. There's a lot of other things that go into it. Um, and if your house is not up to spec, and I can tell you, a lot of these houses that people are buying uh, for let's say hundred thousand dollars, they've been rented out before, and the people that have left these houses probably made them in a very bad state. You know, so they might have you know, kicked open the drywall. They might have done a lot of things to the plumbing. So that stuff has to get fixed as well. So you may have a cheap property at 82000 but you may you may be spending, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars 20000 getting it just up to where you can actually rent out the property uh, to, you know, potential uh, rentees. I see. What about, I mean, so uh, you talked about property taxes. You talked about um, uh, property management costs. So if you had a condo in, you know, 
over here for instance you buy a 9 uh, 90 lakh or a 1 crore condo in gurgaon you play pay about 4000 rupees per month uh, as management fees you know uh, maintenance fees if you make it um, right and i've heard the equivalent in the us is substantially higher uh, so i mean 4000 a month is about what 100 dollars a month Oh yeah, that's not going to get you much. I remember when I looked at some of these uh, condos when I was living there. Is if you look at how much, you know, let's say your monthly payment maybe is a rental. So let's say it's a thousand dollars a month, you know, or that's that's kind of what you're paying uh, to your, you know, your to service the debt. You're paying a thousand dollars a month. Let's say you'll probably end up spending uh, maybe I would say maybe two three hundred of that a month just on. Um, the the actual you know home association fee or what they call o, you know HOA homeowners association fee so it could be 20% could be as high as 20% could be much lower as well it really depends and and that's part of the that, that's part of the issue is if you've got a homeowners association fee that's very low then typically you know the service is not great you may not get the kind of people you want to rent now if, now if the fees are much more expensive then you're going to get people that really want to stay there they may have a pool facility they may have a lot of different things so it really depends but it definitely is i would say i would say around 15 to 20% per month which is you know pretty 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 uh, pricey if you think about it yeah yeah 200 dollars well, or 100000 dollars that's that's uh, on a on a $1000 payment that's about a house worth 100000 no well about 150000 dollars that's about 60 lakhs uh, you're saying that it's about 200 dollars it's about 9000 rupees a month Uh, yeah. If you look at it in India, it's it's. I mean, compared to India, it's a huge cost. So you don't think about yeah. that as as a big big cost. But then, you know, it's it's huge when it comes down. If you don't, for instance, have a person renting because one person has just moved out, another has yet to move in, you got to right. pay that anyway and out of your pocket, really. Exactly. So that's something you have to build into the cost when you rent it out to somebody. So those are things that you know people kind of don't realize when they actually look at these prices. So I mean, there's there's a lot of pitfalls, and you know what I always tell people is, you know, if it's such an amazing deal, you know, then I would imagine the local people would also jump on the deals. I mean, I can tell you, you know, people may hear all the press about you know the U.S. economy being bad, but there are a lot of you know groups coming together that are buying some of these properties, you know, in the U.S. And so you're kind of competing against those guys. It's sort of I would say very similar to here Bombay. If you look at New Bombay, Nope in Mumbai. I mean, there's a lot of potential out there for a lot of properties to be bought, and yet people are not buying them. What's the reason? You know, people always talk about Bombay and how you know how great it is and how expensive it is. But if you go all the way out to Navi Mumbai, the rates are pretty uh, pretty reasonable. Yet there are buildings upon buildings upon buildings that are sitting completely empty. You you know, I I lived there what two years ago when we met, and I I can tell yep. you that if those buildings are still unoccupied. That place is in real trouble because it, it was it was yep. it was an empty place even then. I mean, it's connected by its trains. It's got the whole jing bang of infrastructure. Even despite of that, uh, if those those houses are not occupied, you have a problem. Which could be the same thing with the LA property. It might be so far away. You have these great you have great roads that take you there, but then nobody wants to live there. It's just, you know, it just nobody wants to live there. So. Exactly. So that's the same thing, and you know, not only that, but there's also a lot of you know empty uh, commercial properties as well. I mean, I think there's at least three, four malls in that area that are you know completely not doing anything. You know, the the big you know mall out that in that in that part of town uh, is uh, in Orbit Mall and is doing very well. But the other malls that came up around that same time are not doing anything. They're you know pretty much empty. So the other thing is, you know, people may say, oh, there's a lot of commercial real estate available as well. It may not be in the best location, and that's I think you know the key that everybody talks about when you're looking at buying property, whether it's commercial or it's residential. It comes down to three factors: location, location, location. Yeah, I, I can imagine, and I I think your uh, uh, location, the location argument works most from the retailer perspective on a commercial real estate thing, but then it also works on the fact that if you have good commercial activity, you can have great residential activity as well. um so right and 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 the us is a lot more spread out than you know people in india think you know la is like they say la but it's like seven or eight cities or seven cities that i mean it's 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 almost talking it's like bombay you can go all the way from south bombay all the way to juhu virar even much further than that and that you know that would take at least 
two, three hours by car in Bombay to travel. And you're not traveling very far. You're traveling maximum 20, 30 kilometers. Now imagine you're traveling 30, 40, 50 miles. You know? But granted, the infrastructure is much better. But it still could take you two, three hours to get from you know, the south, which is Orange County, up to the north of the L.A. County. And that's still considered you know, the greater Los Angeles you know, metro area. And that could take you quite some time. Wow. And, and some of these places that you say that are cheap are, are actually even outside of these zones. Yeah, so these properties that they talk about are in the area called the Inland Empire, what they refer to as the IE. And that is very much, you know, inland. It, you know, it's very much east. I would say it's at least a good 50, 60 miles from, you know, the coastline. And they're very much, you know, inland. And so they're nowhere near. I mean, so if you were to fly into LAX airport, you can bet you can at least be in a car for the next hour and a half to get to the house that you might have bought. So it takes some time. Wow. 50, 60 miles, man. I mean, that's like buying a house in Bangalore and living halfway to Bangalore and considering it, you know, in the same city. My God, that's yeah. huge. Yeah, that is. Wow. So that that, that clear, clears a lot of that stuff. But um, that, that's interesting. I mean, probably there's, there's hidden stuff in the U.S. we got to look at. Now, if you consider that, okay, the U.S. isn't growing all that much and they're having trouble with the economy and all that stuff, India, on the other hand, is this great place. You've got courage, right. you've got concentration in the cities, so you can buy an urban piece of real estate and you know, expect it, kind of expect it to rise over the longer term. Uh, if somebody from America or somebody from Europe wanted to buy property in India, uh, considering you've lived here for a while, you've probably seen a lot of real estate, uh, both the ups and the downs in the last right. three years. But what would you say, you know, to them? Would you, would you, would you say? What would you say would be the things that they need to look out for? So, I mean, I kind of briefly touched on it. I think it's the same thing. You know, everybody reads the headlines. They look at Bombay. They're like, wow. I remember this, you know, one of my friends called me maybe about three years ago. And he said, hey, I've got a decent amount of money. I want to spend some money. I want to get a flat in Bombay. So I asked him, you know, how much money do you want to spend? And we kind of went back and forth, back and forth. And he was like, oh, I want to spend about, you know, about $100,000, which is, you know, 50 lakhs. So I kind of said, you know, you're not going to get anything for 50 lakhs. I mean, that's very much the same thing. You know, you're going to be halfway between Bombay and Pune. You'll be in, in somewhere in that area. So what I would tell people is, you know what, it may seem inexpensive, you know, when you read about it. But when you actually come on the ground, the same thing applies, location, location, location. Now, the stuff that I talk about is from my perspective in Bombay. And, I, you know, I've traveled to Pune quite a bit. But I know other areas, you know, I would say Bangalore or Hyderabad, they're not as expensive as Bombay. But if you were to talk to a local person, they were like, oh, my God, rates are very expensive. You know, I just talked to somebody in Pune, and the rates maybe, you know, in certain parts are going for, you know, 14,000, 15,000. And there's apparently a new building coming up that's opening at 18,000 rupees. Now, when you convert that and you think about it from a, from a U.S. perspective, it may seem pretty cheap. But the local people say that's very expensive, 18,000. They've never seen that. So that's happening as well. 18,000 rupees a square foot. Yeah. Exactly. So that's it. So, I mean, I would tell people, you know, you know there, there's a lot of hype around it, you know, and you hear all these people, you know, I mean, I see the ads also, you know, buy a flat in Dubai. You know, it always seems like people are trying to say the, the deals are in some other country. And I think the reason why they do that is because they know it's much tougher to track, you know, and the minute you've got something, it's, it's much tougher to unload. So they know they kind of have you locked and loaded. So same thing here, you know, when people, you know, come from the U.S. and they look at property here, it's not as easy as it seems. And there's a lot of issues. Rental is definitely an issue. I mean, I know a lot of people that have flats in Bombay and they're completely empty. And I'm like, why don't you rent the flats out? And I think everybody understands because, you know, the tenancy laws are very strict and you don't want, you don't want to be in a situation where your flat is basically, you know, lost. And that happens quite a bit, you know. So, of course, now you know, the rules are much, much more tighter. But the thing is, if you're not here living 24 by 7, you know, there's a chance that something may happen. And, you know, if you can't re respond to it right away, you know, with a, the with a court case or with the cops involved, you know, it may be gone forever. So you have to kind of tread with caution when I tell people when they want to invest here in India when it comes to real estate because it's not very transparent. It's very opaque. I mean, a lot of it also revolves around, you know, black money versus white money. You know, a lot of the local people may want to, you know, pay with black and if you're in the U.S., you obviously want everything in white because that's the only thing how you can remit your money back. So kind of a catch-22 on both both sides of it. I, I see. Yeah, that's that's true. And I mean, that's one of the that's probably one of the attractions if you look at it. You know, the rental uh, laws and, and eviction laws that that are probably more uh, 
Well, it's just the fact that you may be strict here, but the point is, it takes a lot of time to evict somebody if they're a tenant and they evict. Yes. So even if they don't pay you rent, you want to take like a couple of years at least to get even a preliminary decision, and then you know it, it's it's a long court process. So um, would that then be an advantage to buying properties in say the U.S. or Singapore, where you know tenancy laws are much better? So and plus laws, you know, the fact is over here you could go pay a, buy a parcel of land. And tomorrow, somebody might come in and say, "Listen, in 1950, my great grandfather, uh, you know, separated from the family that sold you this property, but he owns right. the stake, so you can't buy, you can't build on this. You know, I know you paid for it, but you can't build it. The court case can take years. Um, that kind of stuff doesn't happen in the U.S. So, no, that definitely does not, and that's, I mean, that's one of the reasons why a lot of these guys are pitching, saying you want to buy property in Singapore or buy property in the U.S. Because that's one issue you don't have anything. I mean, it's pretty clear you own it; it's yours. Um, like I said, the, the the tenancy laws in the U.S. are not they're strict, but they're not that bad. Everything is by the books, you know. So if someone has said that they're going to rent the flat, you know, the rent the apartment for you know twelve months, then pretty much in twelve months you can guarantee that that person is going to leave. So I would say, you know. One of the reasons why, why you may want to buy some property is, let's say you've got someone that's going to college or someone that's planning on living in the U.S. long term, that may be a good time to buy something now, you know, and it'll be an asset, you know, let's say 10, 15 years from now. Now, will it start appreciating any, you know, will it appreciate anytime soon? That I don't know. I don't think anybody can predict. But from what I can tell, it seems like there's a lot of excess inventory in the system and it may take 10 years. You know, nobody wants to talk about 10 years, but you know what? It could be. You know, we've already been, you know, sitting for, since the peak of 2007. We're still, you know, we're four years away from it and still things have not gone anywhere, you know, and people are now talking about how a lot of these, uh, you know, four property uh, sales, they're, they're now turning into, you know, rental properties. And then I think once the economy picks up, they'll convert those rental properties again back into for sale. So there's a lot of this hiding of inventory, what they call shadow inventory. Mm -hmm. You know, there may be, you know, like 20,000 homes on the market, but they may not be on the market, you know, publicly. So there's a lot of this shadow inventory that I think is still there, and it may take, you know, may take 10 years to unwind. I mean, that's a that's a long time, but uh, it's it's possible. So I think the best case is if you have a real need for this property that you're going to be living in the U.S. If you're going to college, or you're planning on, you know, you've got kids that are going to go to college, or you've got relatives that are going to be living in the U.S. Things like that, then it makes sense to potentially buy a property in the U.S. You wouldn't suggest it for a pure rental yield kind of uh, concept. Uh, it's possible, but I think you have to really find that right. You know, you know that what I guess they call the rental yield curve or something like that. So you make sure that you know that fits in your parameters. The other thing is maybe if you've got somebody that you know that can kind of at least help you manage the property, then that's another thing. You know, if you've got a relative in the area or if you've got a good friend, that makes a big difference. There you go. That's, that's you know the. Well, that's that's brilliant actually. You come you come down to the fact that you know it's not as attractive as it seems. It's got a lot of hidden costs in it, and prices may or may not appreciate, which is um, which is something Indians don't understand. Well, right, it has to go up, right? So uh, yeah. we we just I mean our, our banks don't even have that concept of prices going down. I'm sure they they use spreadsheets where they don't have a negative field for input. Uh, when, you know, when you're trying risk ratios, you're like, oh, housing prices, uh, will they go up only 1% or will they only go, will they go up 5%? Uh, you know, that, but, uh, you know, considering there's not much in terms of price appreciation in the U.S. and considering the, the model um, uh, probably the transfers very differently when you invest in India versus the U.S., uh, people have to be careful uh, of what they go in. And, and you rightly said they have... Uh, uh, people who have a need are probably better in position to buy such houses. I mean, that's good because at least you don't have to go in with your uh, um, eyes closed. You don't just get attracted by reading these articles. And right. And the other thing is, you know, there, there's also a limit on how much money you can remit to the U.S. So that's the other issue as well, you know. So, you know, I mean, if you really want, like, an amazing property that may cost a million dollars, you may not be able to remit that money. That's so that's the other issue. A year now, right now. Was it two hundred thousand a year? So uh, technically, yeah. over five years, you could build up to a million dollars. But um, you know, uh, five years later, that property might not be available. You know, so right. Uh, so now I think that's the issue. Is I don't know. Can you actually take a loan out on that amount or not? You can take because a I thought loan. there was some issue on leverage and things like that. So you, right? here's the thing: your problem is going to be that they're not going to accept it as collateral in India. 
uh, yes. an American bank is not going to give you a loan because you you have no way to recover that. So, That's true. Uh, you got this problem of saying, well, if I buy that house on a loan, I got to put some other property as collateral uh, to be able to get that loan. The so there's true. lots of other tax implications because now that you you you've taken it as a non-housing loan. Uh, you don't get the tax benefits of having invested in India as well. True. At the same time, and plus you don't get the American low mortgage rates, uh, the five percent a year. So oh, yeah, you that's... might end up borrowing at fifteen or fourteen percent in India and try to deploy it in an asset whose yield is about what three percent, four percent now uh, in after costs. So you know you have to bank on a negative eleven percent cash flow every year, but you hope that the prices will go up 11% or 20% to appreciate to compensate for it so right uh, it's it's probably an equation that doesn't make sense you know on the on the paper part of it but then you might get a distress sale that you could you could turn around fairly fast and for people who you know people have a lot of money i don't know how they have that much money that's lying around so you know they right. put it in shares they're very very you know i don't want to do shares i i want you know fixed deposit and that's it but they consider real estate to be quite safe, so very safe. Of course, invest, you know, because you know they consider it safer. They have that kind of money lying around. They might not even need the loan. True. There you go. Good so, point. I, I think um, the 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 downside of investing in the U.S. from here is the fact that it's so far away, you can't control it. And um, even if you did hire a property management company in the U.S., if you did do a little bit of the um, you know the groundwork around uh, trying to figure out what a part what works. The problem is the dynamics change every six months to a year. You know a new Walmart comes in the vicinity, the property prices may go up. A Walmart shuts down, the property prices. You know it, it, the property prices change because of the nature of surroundings. Um, tomorrow, if uh, you know there was a fear of I don't know an earthquake in LA, they've always been talking about you. Of course, uh, yeah. There actually is some kind of a quick LA. Right. Property from eighty-two thousand is going to become forty-two thousand, just like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that, I think that's this. I mean, I think the issue around you know if a Walmart comes in, things like that, that may not happen as much. I mean, they don't fluctuate that much. I think we're already in that down cycle where I don't think any real bad news can really take it any further. It's just that the appreciation may not happen, you know, on the upside as quickly as people would like. Yeah, I mean, and and ten, eleven percent per year is kind of like way out of line for the U.S., right? Very much so. And that 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 that's a good way to end it. It's like now, if you're banking on price appreciation to go to the U.S. and buy a property, just don't do it. You got need, real need. You got kids you want to send to college over there. You might want to consider that. Perfect. That's exactly. A fantastic way to end end that, Manish. Thanks a ton for uh, for your input. Um, you might say you don't know quite as much, but honestly. We're, you know, running blind here. So, yeah, it's brilliant to have you on the show again. Anytime, Deepak, anytime. Take care, and we'll do this again soon. Absolutely. And thanks for watching, folks. This is uh, Deepak from Market Vision signing off and then with Manish from M Profit. Uh, do watch the show. We'll, we'll do more uh, such topics. Leave in your comments and tell us what you think.